And they want to come up. So, uh, novel approach to treating bioprosthetic valves. Uh, I've been wanting to hear about this because I have not done it yet, and uh, and uh, people say it's easy and fun. So, uh, <laughs> can I just ask? Um, so, who who has heard about this? Purposefully fracturing bioprosthetic valves. Who's done it? Okay, good. We'll, we'll talk hopefully. Uh, Okay, good. It is, um, sure, everything's easy. Is it off-label? It's off-label. <laughs> it is off-label. Okay, so, uh, you know, I just put this slide in to show that, you know, valve-in-valve -valve therapy is a good therapy. Uh, so if you look at the 30-day outcomes uh, in the Vivid Registry, Danny's Registry, 93% of patients have class 1 or 2 heart failure symptoms following valve-in-valve -valve TAVR. So it is a good procedure. Uh, the average mean gradient was 16 millimeters of mercury. So maybe the average mean gradient is a bit higher than what we see for native valve TAVR. But I, I'm not sure that this uh, graph has, has gotten enough um, press, to be honest with you. So if you look at this, this is from you know, Danny's uh, JAMA paper. Um, if you look at mortality in patients who had a large surgical valve placed, their one-year mortality was about 6%. If the patients had a medium-sized valve placed, then their one-year mortality was 18%. And if they had a small surgical valve prior to valve and valve TAVR, their one-year mortality is 25%. So the smaller the surgical valve, the higher the mortality, and not by a little bit. I mean, this is not subtle. This is a, a big uh, you know, gap between uh, these, these mortality curves. And so this raises the you know, uh, issue of patient prosthesis mismatch, which we know is a problem even with just surgical AVR. The bottom line from this, uh, this slide is that uh, patient prosthesis mismatch is associated with worsened clinical outcomes, increased morbidity, and increased mortality. And that's the concern with valve and valve TAVR and small surgical valves. So I'll just show you a case of ours. Um, we treated a patient with severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis who had had a 21 millimeter magna uh, bioprosthetic valve placed. The true internal dimension of that valve is 19 millimeters, and we treated the patient with a 23 millimeter core valve. These are the baseline hemos. Mean gradient was 36, and the aortic valve area was 0 0.8. And this is our result after valve and valve TAVR. The mean gradient was still 26 millimeters of mercury, and the aortic valve area is 1.2. And I, you know, I could ask you to raise your hand if you've had a case like this, but I'm sure you have. Um, this is, I don't know, is this a success or is it not a success? The patient does not have severe aortic stenosis at this point, technically, but what is the durability of this procedure gonna be for this patient? And so we did a bioprosthetic valve fracture. And so if you look at this, you can see the waist of the balloon and you can see it give, I'll just play it again. Uh, maybe I will. Supposed to loop, but just look at it give right there. Okay. And these are the final hemodynamics. So the mean gradient's nine, the aortic valve area is 1.6. And so I think we did a good thing for this patient. What did you use at nominal size? That was a true, that was a 22 millimeter true. 22. Yeah. So um, the, the series that we published uh, is uh, for 20 patients at nine centers. Uh, 12 of the patients were treated with self-expanding TAVR valves. Eight patients received balloon expandable TAVR valves. 19 cases were transfemoral. The mean STS was 8.4. The valves were about 10 years old. And the mean true inner dimension was 17.8 millimeters. So these were, these were small surgical bioprostheses. TAVR was performed prior to balloon fracture in 15 of the 20 cases. And in the, in the 20 patient series, the baseline mean gradients were 42. After valve and valve TAVR, the mean gradient was 21. That's the average mean gradient. And after uh, bioprosthetic valve fracture, the mean gradient was seven. Valve area to start with was 0 0.6. After valve and valve TAVR, the valve area is 1.0. And after a bioprosthetic valve fracture, the valve area is 1.8. So it sounds crazy, I know. So complications of BVF. So we're up to 33, uh, actually we're up to, I think, 36 cases now, uh, 12 centers. Um, we're, we're just trying to collect data. So if we could talk later and if, if anybody, you know, uh, does cases in the future, I, I'd be very interested in your data. These are the three complications we've observed. One embolic stroke 
on post-op day one, meaning the day after TAVR. This patient had a, a MCA stroke and he had full recovery. One flail anterior mitral valve leaflet. So, and I don't even know that I've heard of this with TAVR in general, uh, you know, having a flail leaflet, um, but that patient's gonna have surgery and it's a bad, it's a bad flail. Uh, it's an A3 flail for what it's worth. And then one severe AI from the core valve uh, that was treated with a second device. And I'll go over this stuff a little bit later. I've got ideas on all this stuff. Um, and that, that was fine. The second device took care of the AI and the, the procedure was fine, but it was still a complication. The theoretical complications that people ask about we really haven't seen in the data that I know about. No aortic root injuries, no annulus ruptures, no coronary occlusion, no you know, increased pacemaker. I, I've not heard of any pacemakers following um, uh, BVF. No embolic debris, you know, we, we can argue about this one embolic stroke and whether that was related to BVF or not, it's unclear. So the important thing to understand is how these valves fracture. So first of all, the, the Dacron material stays intact, okay? So the inner ring is gonna fracture, but if you look at the valve, these were uh, valves that were fractured on the bench, you don't see that the valve is fractured, okay? The, the outer sewing ring remains intact, and if you dissect the sewing ring, then you see that the inner uh, ring has fractured. Okay, um, if you look at a CT reconstruction, this is a 23 millimeter core valve and a 21 magna. You see the single fracture point of the um, uh, biprosthetic valve and the ring is otherwise intact. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, this is the wrong slide. <laughs> this is the right slide. <laughs> so if you wanna do this, first of all, uh, we bench tested these valves. So if you, if you go to the, the uh, manuscript and uh, annals of thoracic surgery, you can see which valves can be fractured and at what atmospheres they fractured uh, on the bench. So that gives you a guideline. It may not be exactly the same in the body, but the trifecta valve and the Hancock II valve, we couldn't fracture on the bench. We ruptured multiple balloons. Um, and I can tell you that we, we think we can stretch a trifecta and still get some benefit there, but we, but we don't fracture the valve. If you want to do this, this is what you need. You need a non-compliant balloon. You need a 60cc syringe. You need an inflator. You need a high-pressure stopcock. And, um, and here's the setup. So you've got the, uh, the um, I guess we don't, let's see, does that work? So we got the balloon here, high pressure stopcock, you got your syringe and you got your inflator. And uh, the first thing you're gonna do is um, have the stopcock open to the syringe and you're gonna do a hand inflation. The balloon is then gonna be uh, inflated um, and then you're gonna turn the stopcock so that you're off to the syringe onto the inflator and then you can dial up to the atmospheres you need, okay? And then how do you go down? Do you go down only with the big syringe? Or? Yes, so then um, what will happen is uh, when the valve fractures, your, your inflator pressure will immediately drop to practically zero. Then you open the stopcock to the syringe and you go negative on the syringe to deflate the balloon. So what are those types of pressures that you're getting? So they're between 10 and 20 uh, atmospheres. Um, in, the, in the body, the, you know, for example, so if you go back here, um, you know, for example, the Edwards Magna in, on the bench was 24 atmospheres, but in the body, in our 20K series anyway, uh, the valves fractured at 16 to 18 millimeter, uh, atmospheres. So when we fractured them on the bench, we didn't have a TAVR valve inside the valve. Uh, that was just a balloon and a valve. Having the TAVR valve in first, you know, will decrease that diameter a, a bit further, and then maybe you need less pressure to fracture the valve. So that's a possibility. Uh, and then, you know, I don't know, the, the body temperature and things like that may also, whoops, uh, sorry. So I just want to talk about those two complications, and we touched on it briefly, but I think two of the complications may have been related to balloon position. The ruptured mitral cord, you know, the best I can surmise, the wire must have been in the wrong place, but also the balloon was too ventricular, okay? And then, and then the uh, inflation of the balloon resulted in a ruptured cord. The disruption of the core valve frame. So if you look at the core valve, uh, you know, and as you know, it's a supraannular valve. This constrained segment of the core valve has a uh, lesser diameter than the, you know, quote unquote label size of the core valve. And um, so you need to understand what size balloon you're using, what size the constrained segment of the core valve is, and you cannot have your balloon, the balloon you're using is probably gonna be larger than the constrained segment. So it's gonna have to be below the constrained segment, otherwise you, you risk injuring uh, the valve. 
And the true balloons that we have been using true balloons, they're four and a half centimeters in length. But now that we've seen these couple of complications, uh, we are wondering whether two and four centimeter balloons would be better. You can get Atlas Gold and Vita balloons in two centimeters. And really you only need to uh, dilate the valve, the valve ring. That's all you need. Two centimeters should be plenty. So I think this is very early on, but we need to talk about how, how this type of procedure should best be done. So my conclusions are that valve and valve taver and small surgical bioprosthesis may be associated with increased incidence of um, pace, uh, patient prosthesis mismatch and higher mortality. Most bioprosthetic valves can be fractured with a high pressure balloon inflation and BPF results in lower residual valve gradients and larger valve effective orifice area after valve and valve taver. But there are a lot of questions that we need to answer. So does BVF result in long-term improvement in hemodynamics? We don't know that. Does BVF improve survival? That, that's very uh, you know, provocative, but we need to look at that. Does BVF impact the durability of the TAVR prosthesis? So if you put the valve in first and then fracture with a high pressure inflation, how does that impact long-term durability? What factors predispose to complications? Now certainly aortic root injury or aortic annulus rupture could be complications. We haven't seen it yet. And because we haven't seen it, it's hard to understand what factors might predispose to it. But it's still important that you look at your patient and the anatomy and you, you decide whether you think that this is a reasonable thing to do or not. Is it better to do BVF before or after TAVR? We prefer, so me, my institution, our team, we think it is better to do the TAVR first. First of all, maybe you don't need to do the BVF at all. You do the TAVR, if you've got good hemodynamics, maybe you're done. Uh, the, you know, there's always the issue in a bioprosthetic valve of doing a valvuloplasty uh, causing uh, severe AI and then the hemodynamic issues that come with that. So that's one of our concerns. And then the theoretical complications of embolic debris from the degenerated, degenerated valve. It, yeah, it's theoretically possible. So maybe putting in the TAVR valve first to kind of seal that off before you do a high pressure inflation might be beneficial. So that's our thought, but we don't know the answer. When BVF is planned, what criteria do we need to take into account to select the TAVR prosthesis? So, you know, I'll give you ex an example. If you've got a 23 millimeter magna, for example, with a 21 millimeter internal dimension, and you're, pre you're gonna, you know, plan to do a BVF, then you're probably gonna put a 23 millimeter valve in. It's not an issue. You've got a 21 millimeter internal dimension, but you're going to fracture it. You're going to put a 23 in. It makes a lot of sense. But when you got maybe a 19 millimeter internal dimension or a 17 millimeter internal dimension, even if you're going to fracture the valve, what size TAVR valve is optimal there? 20 millimeter S3, 23 millimeter Edwards, 23 millimeter core valve? And we, we don't know all those answers yet. Because that Dacron sleeve remains intact, there's a limit to how much you can, how much you will gain with a BVF. Okay, you're never gonna rupture that Dacron sleeve. And we think, so based on our bench testing, three to four millimeters is the maximum you're gonna get, okay? But if you start with a 17 millimeter internal dimension and you're gonna get three to four millimeters, you're at 20, 21, what's better, a 20 millimeter S3 or 23 millimeter valve? I don't know. Could BVF be beneficial in patients with larger bioprostheses as well? So their hemodynamics may be okay, uh, you know, with valve and valve taver, but if you do a BVF and you more fully expand that valve, could that impact long-term durability as well? We don't know. So I think it's a good procedure, a lot of unanswered questions. Adam, I have a question for you. So we've done a few of these. Um, and I've seen a slide of mitral flow where on a bench top cracking it where the Dacron doesn't cover anymore. When you break it, the oh, really? Dacron's no longer there. Where'd you see that? Uh, you know, Tom Wynn presented this. He's, he's down in Houston. So yeah, I, well, I gave him my slides. Are you sure you didn't see um, just this? This where we dissected the ring. Per perhaps that was this, but, yeah. but I will tell you that we've done a mitral flow where we did have a small periodic hematoma. Okay. That, you know, the patient- We don't want that in our series. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm but just kidding. The, the, the patient did fine, but it was obvious periodic hematoma, a little small effusion, gave some protamine, 
kept the patient intubated one day, and the patient did fine, ultimately, but it was with mitral flow. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing. The other comment that, that's very interesting is that this can be done also in the mitral position. Yeah. And so we've done two patients in the mitral position for patient prosthetic mismatch. One of them, where the leaflets look normal, and uh, we all looked at each other like we were going to get into big trouble uh, when we did it, but the gradients did fall in half after we put in. Um, and what, so what size bloom would you use for a mitral? So, I mean, it's so we huge. have a 25 mosaic. Okay. In, in a right. big guy. So 25 so mosaic. You use 28 true? A 25 mosaic has a 21 internal diameter. Okay. Big difference. We put a 26 mm -hmm. uh, S3N transeptal, and then we broke it with a 24 true, and then went up to a 25 true, gradient dropped in half. Mm -hmm. In a patient who had multiple problems, you know, compassionate and yeah. so forth and so on, I, you know, to your point, um, and the mosaic seemed to be the most favorable to break uh, in the ones that we've done, but it can be done in the mitral position and, and perhaps it's even safer. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned one thing which I didn't mention here. Uh, on the bench, we used a balloon that was one millimeter larger than the labeled valve size. So if it was right. a 21 mosaic, we used a 22 millimeter true balloon, for example, to fracture it. But in reality, you need a, a balloon that's only larger than the internal dimension. And so some of the clinical cases have been done, you know, so, so you have to look at the patient and the anatomy and the sinuses and the aortic calcification and ev everything and try to decide what size balloon you're going to use. But maybe if you're concerned about uh, the annulus or the aorta or the coronaries, you start with a smaller balloon, uh, it does, of course, has to be larger than the internal dimension. And if you use a smaller balloon, you may need a higher pressure to fracture it, but you can maybe fracture it initially with a smaller balloon and then go from there, and you could further expand it if needed. Um, there's also the issue between the difference between a core valve and a, a self exp uh, uh, balloon expandable valve. It might be, we're not absolutely sure of this because we didn't use a fresh surgical valve. We only we didn't have any money for this, so we, we basically stole these valves. We got a couple of valves. We won't tell anybody. But yeah. We didn't use a fresh balloon, but we try a fresh valve, but we what we did is after we fractured them, we put a core valve in and we put a Edwards in and we measured how optimally they expanded they were. And it seemed to be that a core valve expanded. I mean it, it self expanded, it expanded to its optimum dimension. But it 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 seemed to us that with the kind of a relatively compliant balloon of the Edwards sapien valves, that the compliant balloon didn't fully optimize the diameter and that you needed a, actually a non-compliant inflation to get the 23 to a 23, for example. Well, we, uh, we had four cases in Tampa with all of them, for some reason, it was a, a surgeon in, in Tampa with a bunch of 19 millimeters to affect the surgery. So all, all the four we did, there's a, there's a balloon. I'm not sure it's the same one you're describing. It's an ultra-compliant Kevlar bar balloon. Are you using the same one, the one with Kevlar? This, oh. bar, the, this is Kevlar, the true balloon, yeah. Yeah. So this is what we use. We use 19, and we put S3 in all four of them, and all of them. So that the trifecta, I do think you can, and you can see that you can stretch out those posts. The posts you won't yeah. fracture the ring, but you can stretch, stretch the posts out, I believe. And about the mitral position, I had a, a colleague from Greece called me in the summer. He had the same, the same question about the mitral valve. He was asking if he can break the ring. And with the, in the patient with, uh, with bifrostasis uh, failure and previous known mismatch. Mm -hmm. So he was asking how unstable it would get and how he would be able to mount a core valve on the mitral position after he break the ring. So his concern was this. And my understanding is that he, he never broke the ring and he, put, he undersized, I mean, the, the valve finally was undersized, patient didn't do too well. Hmm. So well, this is why I favor doing the TAVR first, you know, or the, or the valve implantation first. Then you don't have to worry about the stability of it. You know, you've got the valve in there, then you fracture it. And I think that things should be stable if you do it that way. Did you guys do any bench testing of trying to break them after you implanted the valve? No. We just, if, so there's a lot of questions we'd like to answer if we had the the money or the or the the stock basically 
But the, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Edwards and Matron, so they're very interested in this, but they're also, whoa, this is like, we don't really want to be involved with this. They won't give you devices. Right. Well, well, one last question, one last comment. Timing go. So some people say, like, if you're using self-expanding valves and valves, it might be reasonable to wait uh, for a few weeks before you fracture the original uh, valve. Would you advocate for that, or you would do the, the, the taver, assess the pressures, if the pressures don't look good, you will do it in the same procedure? So what's the We've only done the same procedure. Why would we? Um, you tell me, what's the um, theoretical benefit of waiting? I mean, like, some people are going to, I'm not really sure if it's, it's really a bad ar argument. They say, like, if you're using self expanding valve, you, your profile through the uh, evolute may actually, your gradient through the evolute may get better and you may avoid yeah. it. I don't think so. I, I not think with a valve and valve tab. I think that's salesmanship BS. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know they, they, they describe, yes, you need 10 minutes for the night not to warm and assess. I, you just, I don't think it's, I don't know. And what about, I mean, you know, what's the cutoff? Yeah. 15 millimeters, is that too much? 20? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know that answer. Yeah, we better move on. Okay. So thank you, Alex. Yeah.